Hi all, in this video, we discuss about the very next topics of module two of professional ethics, which is styled as engineering ethics and professionalism. So in the last video of module two, we actually ended up with the topic moral autonomy. And now let's start with the moral development theories. So when you talk about moral development theories, the first theory that comes into uh, the picture of that comes into the topic is the Lawrence Kohlberg's theories. So La Lawrence Kohlberg proposed that people progress in moral reasoning based on their ethical behavior. <clears throat> he postulated this theory based on the thinking of younger children throughout their growing period as adults. He conveyed that younger children make judgment based on the consequences that might occur and the older children judgments are based on their intuitions. <clears throat> so in this particular theory, all right, so in this particular theory, Lawrence actually focuses on how the younger children and uh, uh, you know, when it comes to an adolescent or uh, you know, older uh, generation, how they make decisions based on the situations. So he says that when we are in a younger age or when we are in the uh, you know very teenage or in the younger uh, stages of the life as such we make judgments based on the consequences of that particular decision so we are well aware about what are the consequences of that particular decision that we are going to make it so we'll be taking decisions based on the consequences of that particular uh, situation or the decision but when we grow old or when we become a um, little more uh, you know matured we take decisions or we make judgments based on our intuitions. So that's what the main crux or the essence of this particular theory. <clears throat> and he states that there are three stages in this particular theory. Starting with stage number one, that is a pre-conventional level or we call it as pre-conventional stage. This is the first level of moral thinking which is generally found in the elementary school level. That means when we talk about elementary school level, we can be, it can be considered as, you know, uh, your pre-KG or KG or up to uh, one, uh, one to uh, fourth standard or something like that. So the thinker at this particular stage tends to think and behave based on the direct consequences that might occur. <clears throat> so as we all know, uh, while, you know, uh, when um, a particular person in his teenage or in a very younger age, he actually makes decisions based on the consequences. So that is, a, that is what the pre-conventional stage explains. And this particular stage again divides into two sub-stages, which is called as avoid punishments and self-interest. And uh, Lawrence basically explains that during the pre-conventional stage, <clears throat> everyone is concerned with two major things. The first one is to avoid punishments. How to avoid the punishments from that particular act. And also the self-interest. That means every individual, every children for that matter will be opportunistic in nature. So in the pre-conventional stage, we take decisions based on the uh, direct consequences that might occur from that particular decision. And that particular stage has been divided into two. That is your avoid punishment and your self-interest. Moving to the second stage, which we call it as conventional level or we call it as conventional stage. So this is a second level of moral thinking which is found generally in the primary and high school level which means that the students are very generally called as students when they actually grow to the second phase in their school level. So it's basically found in the primary and high school level. The thinker at this particular stage <clears throat> tends to think and behave based on the want to please others. So during this stage, every student, even if we focus or even if we think about the students in any school for that matter, he or she will be thinking how to please others, how to impress others. That's why this particular stage has been divided into two, that is getting people to like them and maintaining the functioning in the society. So in this conventional stage, Lawrence basically explains the thinkers or the students or the person will be uh, more focusing on how to impress others, how to please others. For that, he will be focusing on how, uh, you know, how getting people to like them and how best he can maintain the functioning of society. Functioning of society means how best he or she can, uh, you know, obey the rules and the system in which the society works. With that, moving to the third stage of Lawrence theory, 
that is what we called as post conventional level the post conventional level or we called as a last or a third level of moral thinking which we generally found at the higher school level in this level the thinker at this stage tends to think and behave based on the sense of justice which means that this is a stage where we all are grown up and we actually think in the sense of justice what is just what is fair we actually think in terms of fair and just so that's why this particular stage has two sub stage which we called as reject rigidity of laws this is a stage where the students or the uh, person have a tendency to you know uh, to reject the very rigid laws that exist in the society and they always stands for justice that's why it is called as sense of justice all right so these are the three stages in this particular theory now moving on to next important theory uh, which basically deals with uh, your uh, what we call it as uh, the uh, moral development theory so in the moral development theory as i rightly mentioned we have the lawrence kohlberg theory the second one we are going to discuss is your carol uh, giglian theory so in the case of uh, giglian theory he opines that kohlberg's theory are biased upon the male thinking process because in kohlberg's theory in lawrence kohlberg theory he basically focus on how uh, you know the male community in the society thinks and how he resolves the problems based on the moral situations <clears throat> so he says that the carol says that men had a tendency to solve problems by applying the ethical principles but whereas carol in his theory sorry carol in her theory proposed that the same three stages okay of kohlberg's but with a different perspective as such so in an exam point of view in a question paper if the question is being asked as explain the kohlberg's theory or even the giglian theory the stages remain the same whereas in kohlberg's theory he actually focuses on the male community how they resolve the issues based on the moral sides of the situations <clears throat> whereas in the giglian theory the stages remain the same but the perspectives and the explanations differs now let's move on to what are the stages in the giglian theory starting with uh, your pre conventional level so again we have three stages your pre conventional level your conventional level and your post conventional level so in your pre conventional level it says that a person in this stage cares for oneself to ensure the survival <clears throat> which means that again he is very you know uh, opportunistic he actually uh, caters his his or her self interest that is what we call it as pre conventional level that's why he cares or he or she cares for oneself or for himself or for herself the second stage is your conventional level in this stage the person feels responsible and shows care towards others so the second stage we call it as conventional stage where the people actually tends to think about others the welfare of the society welfare of others then with that moving on to the third stage or the last stage which is a post conventional level in the last stage or the post conventional level in this stage where the principles of care for self as well as others is accepted so in the final stage the person will think about his own welfare and others welfare that means the individual welfare and the societal welfare so this is the giglian theory which uh, includes the three stages your pre conventional which always stands for your self interest your conventional level who always take care of the uh, welfare of others in the post conventional level which actually <coughs> takes care of the welfare of individual and the society now next move on uh, sorry next uh, discuss about uh, the very important topic from module 2 that is your consensus and controversy what is the difference between these two topics or these two titles we normally use uh, uh, these two topics interchangeably in our life during presentations during casual conversations and all so now let's examine <clears throat> what's the meaning of consensus what's the meaning of controversy the word consensus is a state where people come into a common agreement with the judgment given and will leave the people with a feel that justice has been delivered whereas controversy is a state where persons involved in an issue is not satisfied with the verdict so consensus when we talk about consensus it's basically uh, deals with uh, you know 
kind of a satisfaction that the people get from that particular judgment. <coughs> Everybody is happy. In the case of consensus, everybody who is involved in that particular issue is really happy with the judgment or the decision which is being made. They have a feeling that justice is being delivered. Whereas in the case of controversy, as a title suggests, controversy means the person who is believed or the person or the people who are actually involved in that particular situation or in that uh, instance is not happy with the verdict or not happy with the decision. So they feel that there, there were some sort of biased decision made or uh, some sort of partial interest were there in that particular decision. So that is about the difference between your consensus and controversy. I repeat, consensus is where the people have a satisfaction and they are happy with the decision. Whereas in the case of controversy, they are not satisfied with the decision. They can move to the next level because of the partial interest involved in it. Now, let's move on to the next important uh, topic from module 2. That is, <coughs> what is the difference between profession and professionalism? Because since you all are engineering students, from the very first semester of your engineering career itself, like uh, people or the faculty members used to say like, you are professionals. You are doing a professional course. So you need to aware, you need to distinguish between what is the difference between profession, what is mean by professional, and what you mean by professionalism. All right, so let's start with profession. Profession means a job or an occupation that helps a person to earn his or her living. The main criteria of a profession involves the following things, that is advanced expertise. That means we need, we need to have a knowledge about the things, self-regulation. We need to plan accordingly. We need to plan to do things in a proper way. And public good. Public good means through that profession, we basically aim for the welfare of the society. All right. So profession is nothing but a job or an occupation which helps us to earn something for our living. For example, my profession, uh, being a teacher, teaching is my profession. All right. Now, moving to what do you mean by professional? Okay. Professional is a person who is paid for getting involved in a particular profession in order to earn a living as well as to satisfy the laws of that profession. So when we move to, you know, when we move from profession to professional, uh, professional basically focus on a person who is actually involved in that particular profession. All right. For example, teaching is a profession. So when I talk about, uh, you know, assistant professors, uh, in a college, they are professionals because they are associated with teaching and they are giving their best to teach or impart knowledge to students. So that's the difference. All right. Now, what do you mean by professionalism? That is where the more focus is being uh, given. So professionalism is an art that can be understood as a practice of doing the right thing, not because of one feels, but regardless of how one feels. Which means that Professionalism is basically a practice. It's an art where we actually practice of doing what exactly is right. We normally use this to say that uh, in the working area, you need to be very professional or the professionalism has to be maintained. Being a teacher, my professionalism is nothing but to impart the knowledge in the right way, to value the answer script without any biasness or without any partial interest involved in it assign the internal marks without any biased feelings. So these are the, you know, being a teacher, these are the professionalism that I should maintain. So it is by, it is an art of practicing what exactly is right. And professionalism cover comprehensively all areas of practice of a particular profession. And it requires skills and responsibility involved in engineering profession. So when it comes to engineering, it requires the engineering skills to solve the problems and to enhance the professionalism. All right, so with that, moving to the next important topic, that is models of professional roles. Or we call it as professional roles of engineers in the society. What are the roles of engineers that can be, you know, um, which actually plays a very important role in society? When we talk about engineers, they are considered to be the problem solvers. They actually update the technologies. They, uh, you know, resolve any kind of technical issues that arises in the society. So th these are the common your or uh, common dialogues or common slogans that we use to come across when we talk about engineering or engineers. But specifically, when we talk about the roles of engineers, it uh, follows 
the following um, titles. We consider engineers as saviors. Saviors means they actually save the world with updated technology. What are the technology? Because we know that uh, with, uh, with a fraction of seconds or second by second, the, uh, the technology is updating. So engineers are the real heroes who actually, you know, update the, uh, you know, technology and also that enhances the growth and welfare of the society. Engineers as guardians, they actually guardian, they actually save and also they actually, you know, safeguard the society with, uh, you know, technology as well as the uh, security and the professionalism that they maintain in that particular uh, sector. Engineers as bureaucratic servant, they also maintains a code of ethics, a code of conduct, a code of rules and regulations in the society. In that way, they actually plays the role of bureaucratic servants. Engineers as social servants, engineers are also considered to be social servant because ultimately these all, you know, this problem solvers, this uh, technical issues is being solved. Everything comes uh, uh, into the matter of the welfare of the society. They actually pertain to the welfare of society. In that regard, we can say that engineers as social servants. And engineers as social enablers and catalysts. So catalysts, we know that it is, uh, it's very important when it comes to uh, a society. They actually accelerate the, uh, the growth of the society. So in order to have, uh, you know, more development, more growth, more updated technology and know-how, we need engineers in society. And finally, we call engineers as game players because the technology has been changed. Even uh, let's take the case of Corona, the pandemic, the, uh, the COVID-19. The COVID-19 has changed the, you know, the situation across the world. The whole education system has changed its platform from offline to online, where the technology, where the engineers plays a pivotal role to support it. So that's about the uh, models or the roles of engineers in the society. So with that, we actually conclude the part B of uh, module 2. We'll be back with uh, the part C, which is the final video of module 2 soon. Thank you.